are these people? So shout out to Reef for partially creating, well, mostly <laughs> creating this. Yeah. Um, what started as one thing eventually became this. Um, so for those of you who get the joke, um, you're welcome. How did that, how did uh, that stay in there? That's what I want to know. Oh, I put that out. What I, you... I, ref I refreshed it. I think we can... It's not Fix on the... But it's not on the... Um, what's on the been published, mail? though. It, I Weird. think Amba was being Weird. silly. Um, yeah. But it's not on the final... It's yeah. not on the published one that is currently up. Uh, so it's just on this, which is fine. Um, but anyway, uh, those of you who know the reference to the thumbnail, let us know in the chat. Or yeah. if you're watching as, as a clip, let us know in the, let us know in the comments. Yeah. Um, but we're not talking about those Hannibals. We're talking about this Hannibal, as in yeah. the Hannibal Directive. Uh, mm -hmm. Shout out to a friend to the show, Savvy Sabs. We tweeted this out on Monday where she pulled and Haretz is has a paywall, so obviously we cannot read that article, but she did uh print out she did tweet out the at least part of the article where she tweets Haretz finally admitting IDF was ordered to use the Hannibal Directive on October seventh. Yeah, uh, something so we knew happened there. forever. Right. Um, I mean, multiple um, people called this out. Right, and we'll get into that. But um, Haaretz reported IDF ordered Hannibal Directive on October 7th to prevent Hamas taking soldiers captive. Hamas. There was crazy hysteria and decisions started without being... being decisions started being made without verified information. Documents and testimonies obtained by Haaretz revealed the Hannibal Operational Order, which directs the use of force to prevent soldiers being taken into captivity, was employed at free army facilities infiltrated by Hamas, potentially Hamas. endangering civilians, civilians as well. So Haaretz, essentially, believe, by the way, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, so it's their means basically to take out their own. Rather than, and actually, you know what? Well, I won't say anything because there's going to be more that will be described described regarding this. Um, so we'll hear from. Actually, you can go back. Yep. Yeah. Who mm. explains what this is? Um. So you can go ahead, and then we'll get more into it. Cool. Uh, let me go here. There we go. Mm hmm. Quite clear that on yeah. October seventh, a good number. We don't. You don't hear that. Gotcha. I can't um, hear it, but yeah, I know it's wrong. One day this plugin will not make me do a little flip flop, but till then, um, quite clear that on yeah. October seventh, a good number. We don't know what the number is, but a good number of the Israelis who were killed were not killed by Hamas, they were killed by the IDF. And I find that hardly surprising given the nature of the fight that was taking place. It is hard to discriminate in those situations. Now, the Hannibal Doctrine is a very different matter. The argument there or the claim there is that what the Israelis do uh, is that if it looks like an Israeli soldier or even an Israeli citizen is going to be captured by Hamas or, or some other terrorist uh, group, uh, to use the Israelis' language to describe those groups, then the, uh, uh, the IDF will kill those Israelis so that they don't become hostages. And, and the logic here is that uh, Israelis have such a high regard for human life that if hostages are captured, it will be almost impossible for Israel not to pay an enormous price to get those hostages back. So it's better to surreptitiously kill them, uh, better for the IDF to surreptitiously kill them uh, rather than have them become hostages. And there is a great deal of evidence that there is this Hannibal doctrine in practice inside of Israel. That's murder. I guess you could call it that. Okay. Yeah. 
so you heard what he said, right? So it's yes. like it's very we would rather to... kill we would rather kill them than having to pay off potential ransom in order yeah. to retrieve them. Well, and it's in World War One, uh, the British would have their t- tanks were such a big deal in World War One, right? Especially mm-hmm. during the later part of the war, um, because the te- it was a technological race, right? So. You don't want the other team to get a hold of your technology to be able to remake it, right? So right. what they would do is they would have carrier pigeons in tanks, carrier doves, that kind of stuff, right? That would then go off, send their own location to, you know, the artillery of your allied group, and they would danger close you. They would blow up your tank so that the Germans couldn't get it or whatever. Um, very similar kinds of processes here, it sounds like, but I think it's more indiscriminate in this case, right? This has to do with hostage negotiation. So, you know, and from, from what I've heard, there's tons of accounts of, you know, Hamas members having to protect hostages with their own bodies, you know, so for this very reason, you know, right. so seems it seems like they don't really care about these hostages. No, uh, and we've that's what we've said for a while is um but even yeah. just with the idea of Netanyahu basically being like you know the fact we, he's bombing Gaza indiscriminately which will put the hostages at, who are there at risk, risk as well. They you would think that there would be tunnels with salt water and cement and like, yeah, they clearly don't care. This is all just right. bargaining chips for them. Right. So, so the excuses to indiscriminately attack and bomb an entire population. Right. But, you know, what do I so, know? Right. So, you know, there were several, not necessarily us, we didn't talk about this directly, but there were several independent media outlets that did call this out from the start yeah. that were smeared and ridiculed. We for, for sure. We definitely have mentioned it. Um, but uh, shout out to this descent. He is a fellow mm-hmm. INM member. Uh, he's yeah. been he's been in Time Nation for a while, but he's now back. Hopefully, um, so we like to. It's one thing to promote independent sources uh, as far as getting you guys some information that is not necessarily mainstream, but it's another thing when it's among our own. So he wrote this Substack. Um, yesterday um, regarding um, how the media got the October 7th story wrong and smear those who got it right. So he reports, with the new revelation that Israel used the Hannibal Directive on October 7th, a retrospective is needed on how the media ignored this story and smear those who got it right. So this then continues. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz has revealed what many have already suspected, that Israel issued an order to use the Hannibal Directive on October 7th. For context, the Hannibal Directive is a military doctrine used by the IDF that encourages them to kill their own civilians to stop them from becoming hostages or prisoners. Middle East Eye Monitor describes the doctrine as one which gives its members the right to kill Israeli citizens, particularly serving IDF members, if feared that they might fall as prisoners. The piece in Haaretz reports that the Israeli military issued this doctrine on October 7th, saying no vehicles can return to Gaza. As the piece says, the message conveyed at 11.22 a.m. across the Gaza division network was understood by everyone. Not a single vehicle can return to Gaza was the order. While the piece could not confirm how many people in total were killed by the IDF, they state that many of the kidnapped people were at risk and exposed to Israeli gunfire. Uh-huh. While the story of Israel killing their own people on October 7th was entirely ignored by mainstream media, it was reported months earlier by independent journalists and outlets such as Max Blumenthal of the Grey Zone, Ali Abdulamar, uh-huh. uh, and David Sheen of Electronic Infotata, Jemmy Shihill of The Intercept, and Mondo Weiss. Not only did the mainstream media ignore the reporting of the affirmation journalists, but they were actually smeared them as conspiracy theorists. 
Sorry. And Holy Cross deniers for reporting what was now been proven to be true. Who is that for? That was it. Was not anyone. I mean, I guess Max oh. Blumenthal in the gray zone, but sure. Oh, um, I think okay. Zay Squirrel as well. Big, big one on that. I think Vanessa mm-hmm. Eva also called this out. B and them. Yeah. You know, there's there's been quite a few on this. So, you know. On November 27th, Haaretz writer Mikhail Parach painted journalist Max Blumenthal as a conspiracy theorist and a manipulator for reporting what her own paper has just confirmed to be true. At one point in the article, Parach tries to discredit Blumenthal by saying, one of Blumenthal's most egregious attempts to deny Hamas's actions has to do with the claims of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. This is ironic because she tries to discredit him by saying another thing he was correct about, as now even the mainstream Times of London paper has noted that there is no evidence of mass rape on October 7th. Yep. Another piece published in Haaretz by Saji Cohen on o- November 7th accused those who said Israel used a Hannibal directive on October 7th of being conspiracy theorists and claimed the doctrine ending in 2016, saying, many conspiracy theorists say the army simply followed instructions under the famous Hannibal directive, which... The army, under then chief of staff, Gadi Eisenhut, canceled in 2016. In certain situations, the directive allowed the endangerment of a soldier's life in order to prevent an abduction. This is again ironic because his own paper had just confirmed that Israel did indeed use the Hannibal Directive on October 7th, proving it was not canceled in 2016. Mm-hmm. The Washington Post has also published a smear piece on those who accurately reported that Israel issued the Hannibal Directive on October 7th. The author, Elizabeth Dwalskin, attacks activist Christina Gutierrez for saying Israel killed their own people on October 7th, something that is now proven to be an objectively true statement. The article also blatantly lies about the claims made by Grey Zone and Electronic Infotata by saying, but articles on Electronic Infotata and Grey Zone exaggerated these claims to suggest that most Israeli deaths were caused by friendly fire, not Hamas. Uh-huh. This, this is a blatant misre- misrepresentation as neither publication has ever claimed that most of the deaths on October 7th were caused by friendly fire. Only some were, a claim that is now proven to be true. The article also tried to paint those who reported there was friendly fire on October 7th as Holocaust deniers saying, influencers who questioned the Holocaust are also among those sowing doubt about October 7th. This is especially gross because many of the journalists who reported on the friendly fire incidents on October 7th, such as Max Blumenthal and Aaron Mate, are Jewish. Uh Something they wish they could take away from them. Right. The Washington Post also failed to disclose that the author of the report, Elizabeth Dwalskin, is a Zionist who once called Palestinians De- desert Bedouins without a sense of national identity as we know it today. As a, Another that national identity, huh? Right. I mean, you mean the national identity that you won't let them fly on a flag post? You mean that national identity? They literally right. have to like make allegories to it with watermelon. You mean that? You mean that national identity? Okay. Another Washington Post article went even further by claiming that Iran funds the Green Zone because one of their editors, Riot Reid, publicly worked for the Iranian outlet Press TV mm-hmm. years before working for the Dray Zone. Wait, feel free to unblock me. You know I'm a nice guy. Um... <laughs> um, the group Cyberwell put out an extremely manipulative video that shows an Israeli family watching a video of the podcast Propaganda and Company and claims that questions around October 7th are akin to Holocaust denial. The clip shown in the video shows the podcast host saying, Palestinians didn't behead babies. This claim is objectively true, as a claim of 40 beheaded babies was debunked early on in the conflict, although people are still saying it, but I digress. This story is an important example of why the mainstream media's concern over censoring misinformation is dangerous. In this instance, just like during the Iraq war and Russiagate, the mainstream media was one was the one spreading misinformation while those in the alternative media who are accused of being conspiracy theorists were proven correct. Currently, while the mainstream media is trying to manufacture consent for the US backed genocide in Gaza, 
it is more important than ever to be skeptical of mainstream claims about Israel and Gaza. Mm-hmm. Um, so, any, use? any thoughts? Well, you know, I think from we we all called this early on, right? Where you know, mm-hmm. footage and pictures of supposed death and dismemberment on October seventh were in ways not capable by Hamas fighters, certainly. Right. You know, that, the of right. That's the, that was vehicles. what I was saying. I think that's what we were saying earlier. I don't remember talking about Hannibal Directive directly, at least with you, but yeah. even back then, I kind of thought this seemed a um, little so, sus in terms of... of stuff of, like, if you actually go through, you know, all the, all the gun nuts and weapon aficionados are like, Hey, that's they don't have that ability. They have RPGs. They don't have the ability, right? Like RPKs, and it's like when we talked about uh, Hindra Job, right? Where they tried to claim that was Hamas. It's like Hamas's fire rate capabilities are only that of what they're capable of getting, which are usually old Russian arms, right? RPKs, AKs, that kind of stuff. So, you know, this is very similar investigative stuff that happens and they get called out on it and it's constantly you know it's it's constantly israel just denying everything until they can't deny it so right you know and even then they try to deny it obfuscate and move past it so yeah i mean it's I, i don't know i i feel like it's just indicative of independent media being pushed aside and all conspiracy dismissed when we seem to be the only ones actually doing the work, you know? So, yeah. uh, you know, told you so, pretty much. <laughs> uh, you know. All right. Like, well, let's get into more details regarding the Hannibal Directive. Uh yeah as it applied to October 7th. So shout out to Nico. Uh, uh, by Hotspot, he reports on this a little bit more. Uh, I think he goes into the article a little bit more stuff that I'm not going to pay in order to pull, so he did. Uh, <laughs> so let's see what he has to say. Yes, sir. Peretz, a publication in Israel, admits that the IDF ordered the Hannibal Directive on October 7th after initially smearing journalists who made this claim months ago. There was crazy hysteria. Decisions were made without verified information. Yup, the documents and testimonies obtained by Haaretz prove that the Hannibal order wasn't implied or insinuated, but they actually used the word Hannibal. One example was at 7.18 a.m. at the Yifta Post after they realized one of the IDF soldiers had been captured. The order was given, Hannibal at Arez, and it came from the divisional headquarters. They dispatched the Zeke, which is a drone, and they handled their business. At 7.41 a.m., the order was given again. That wasn't the last time it was given. In fact, there were multiple times after this that the Hannibal Directive was explicitly given to kill Israeli soldiers so that they would not fall into captivity by Hamas. Do y'all know how many of us were attacked, smeared, berated as anti-Semitic because we reported that the Hannibal Directive had been used and most of us used reporting directly from Israeli documents before to prove that information? Here, Max Blumenthal points out that Haaretz pegged him as a manipulator for reporting on the Israeli army's killing of many Israeli citizens on October 7th. Max also points out that the Washington Post published two lie-filled smears about members of the gray zone for helping to expose the Hannibal Directive scandal. Roger Waters tried to explain this to Piers Morgan, explaining that Israel was responsible for some of the death toll that day on October 7th, and Piers just shrugged him off. Like, nah, 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 that's not true, that's not true. Bro, Sam Hussein tried to ask State Department spokesperson person Miller about the Hannibal Directive just last month and the State Department allegedly never heard of this Hannibal Directive. And I just love how you have all of these propagandists playing stupid or naive as they attack actual journalists for doing their job because it was literally in a Haaretz article that the Hannibal Directive is a thing. It was just canceled allegedly in 2016 by Israel's chief of staff. Yet another lie by Israel. Surprise, surprise. But as usual, it gets deeper. 
Now we all know by now that Israel had advanced knowledge of October 7th before it happened and basically did nothing about it. But what was even crazier is the fact that we found out, thanks to reporting by people like Ben Swan, that they knew that the party goers were being shot at the festival at 7 a.m and told them to fend for themselves. The uh -huh. shooting started at 7 a.m. The IDF didn't show up until 3 p.m. And the military officer responsible for telling them to fend for themselves just so happened to be responsible for the fact that the festival was moved from another area to the border of Gaza that day. So he moved them into the danger and then told them to fend for themselves. So just in case we're keeping score here, journalists were attacked for saying that Israel was at least partially responsible for the lives lost that day. And it turned out we were right. They weren't just indirectly responsible. They literally gave an order to kill Israelis that day. And in at least one instance, a group was moved from a safe location to a dangerous location and then told to fend for themselves as they were being mowed down. So just like the violence we've seen from Israel since October 7th has been so destructive that it seems to have nothing to do with protecting the hostages or targeting Hamas, it seems like even the day of October 7th, all the damage that Israel wreaked that day had nothing to do with protecting or saving Israeli hostages and had nothing to do with specifically targeting Hamas. It, it's almost as if they were looking for a reason to go into Gaza and October 7th gave them that reason. Now, if you wanna call me a conspiracy theory for that, go right ahead. Miko is on another level! Um, I mean, yeah. I remember, I mean, I remember saying way back then, it just seems sus that I said this, that Israel knew of this attack. Yeah. Um, but I, I couldn't say that too loud because mm -hmm. at the time, because it was just like, well, you can, even, like, even people within the network were like, you can say that. You can't say that, you know, like, we need to have more information, but, you know, but it just, yeah, but it just didn't seem, and I said that because at the time, considering with the Iron Dome, you would think that they would have the intel to know um, what was going and and plan accordingly. So it just seemed like they almost allowed this to happen and give and now we have confirmation that that's true yeah as you know as a stepping point and it makes sense that they are, are like hammering october 7th october 7th october 7th is because um this has been because hamas directly attacked yeah. israel like prior to that it was israel who was attacking Palestinians, so we don't care about that shit. But yeah. because the big bad Hamas started to attack them first, again, we've seen this with the victim mentality, you know, of Israel. It's just like, oh no, these these poor people, like, woe is me. You know, these big bad people are now killing us. We got to do something about it. So, yeah, that I was kind of saying back, back in the fall, and even then, it was just kind of like... Ooh, you can't say that. You cannot say that. Do yeah. not say that. You know. So, um, well, so that. I, I mean, we. I've us. said that in private, but I remember that we weren't. We had to be careful saying that in public because YouTube mm -hmm. and then other things. You know, because at the time, you know, we got part. We got demonetized part in part for something very similar. So saying something similar to that at the time that. You know, um, yeah. it's kind of up in the air now. But me, me, Nico mentioned um, Sam Husseini asking this douche, yeah. Matt Miller, about it. Um, so this is about a minute long. So we'll see that exchange uh, and then we can end the segment. You so talk about the hostages. Um, Israel has a Hannibal directive in which um, it has orders in place to kill at least its own soldiers, lest they fall into the hands of Palestinian groups. And there's substantial reporting that that, in fact, 
uh, wa was utilized on October 7th, not just against Israeli soldiers, but against civilians. Um, are we not now in a situation where Israel may be uh, using the Hannibal Directive, not just on Israelis, civilians and military, but on U.S. citizens and other foreign nationals? So I am not familiar in any way with either that supposed directive or those reports. And so you've certainly. never heard so of the Hannibal Directive? You've never heard of the Hannibal John, Directive? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just I mean, immediately dismissed it. I love how anytime this guy or anyone else that is a fucking mouthpiece for the fucking dark lord that runs our country, I just have a whole folder of lie sound bites that I just have to go to. Like I already know, you know? Yeah. Like their their mouth is open. Like Right. <laughs> you know. So but whatever. Yeah. I mean uh, Shout out Nico for for also putting that together. I know he's another one that you know killed it on this. So, but yeah, um, I mean, I will have a victory lap for those of us in independent media who was calling this out from the jump. But too bad that people. And again, it's just the idea of like people in independent media don't know anything or se yeah. seemingly do not know everything when many of them actually do the research. Um, and especially given that Max and Aaron have actively been in Israel and in Gaza several times, you would think that they would kind of know what's going on or at least having a hint of what's going on. I mean, we didn't necessarily, and we talked about this like when we had Miko Palette on mm -hmm. last summer, we didn't know all of this at the time, we, we didn't expect this was going to happen, but we kind of suspected, even given the uh, information that we were talking about Israel prior to October 7th, that something was in, something was going to happen. We didn't know what at the time, but we knew something big was going to happen. And then sure enough, you know, so I think if you're a media long enough, and I think especially if you have watched stuff in Israel long enough, then you will kind of get the sense that something was about to pop off. Right. Um, but I think it's just the idea that we've reported in the past, you know, of Israel targeting Gaza, probably not too many times, but we knew about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, and we definitely knew about it in terms of independent media. But those stories are somewhat dismissed. You don't hear people talking about anything pre-October 7th. You know, like I mentioned, I think a few months ago, that when I, I talked about how in, um, what's that place in Michigan? Um, that's, what's that city in Michigan? Um, large uh, yeah. Arabic Islamic community. Um, oh, uh, fucking like Deer, uh, Dearborn? Dearborn, there we go. Like I reported within that segment that there have been people who have been protesting Biden since, 2021 yeah due to bombings that the idf was committing in gaza then and they were being dare active you. and protesting that but no one cares about that no one wanted to know about that that story was essentially not reported but then october 7 comes up and then because it was hamas that led that strike then it becomes came a big deal. So it's just a lot of the hypocrisy, but a lot of the um, suppression of why why October seventh came to be is really just, I think for us, really frustrating. But but on the other hand, it's kind of validating that these people who were calling this out from the beginning were right, and now even to the point where even the Israeli media has to now admit. And I think they can admit it because it's like, okay, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Right. Nothing. So, yeah. it, so I think that's really more or less the issue is just, they can say the truth, but it's like, okay, well, we're not going to be accountable to it, so you're all not going to do anything about it, so yeah. So whatever. That's, I think that's the more cynical 
side of Israel right now. It's just the right, idea that, yeah, we did it. The deal hey, further. You know? <laughs> I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. So, um, yeah. But, but anyway, so any last thoughts? Nah. Nah. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we've been talking about this shit for a minute. So, uh, you know, nice to be right. Nice to say we told you so. So, um, you know. But anyway, you know, that's the reason why this, partially, why, why this channel is demonetized. Um, so if you want to support us so that we're able to report on stories like this, uh, hopefully in a non-biased way, you can go to that link that you see at the bottom of the screen at Kofi, or you can use your phone and scan the QR code um, to donate to us. And all that money will go to us directly. That's probably one of the benefits of being able to do stuff like this, is that uh, all of your proceeds will go towards the network uh, and not pay YouTube or anything like that. Um, or if you forget the code, you can either go in the description below for all the links where you can donate, or you could type explanation point donate if you forget this one, and you can give to us through that. Um, but we appreciate you guys supporting us and liking our content. Whoops. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, please share it so be able to beat um, how YouTube is suppressing us in the algorithm. Uh, we've appreciated your comments. Uh, that def also helps in pushing our content. Uh, so make sure you do. We do respond many times, especially since we are not at the level where we get too many. So we do respond, especially we also take some um, suggestions as to what stories we should cover. We've done that in the past. Um, and help us, well... You wrote Free K. Uh, uh, but I like, well, I'm saying five, you know. <laughs> sure. Just so you don't have to do this like every thousand. <laughs> Whatever. It's not well, hard for me. Even with, even I with changed Free K, one number, dude. You know? Um, and, but either way, thank you guys for watching. <laughs>